Hi, so today I'm going to talk about the one sample t-test and specifically why a column of ones models the mean. Um, and think about it. For some of you, you might just be thinking, well, of course it models the mean. But if you really think about it, do you know why the parameter is the mean? So make sure you're ready for this. Do you recall how we estimate our parameters in a regression? Um, here I said a simple linear regression simply because I introduced that in the simple linear regression lecture. But actually, we use the same thing to estimate the parameters in all regression. Um, specifically, I guess, if we're using ordinary least squares, which is uh, shorthand for linear regression is OLS, because we're using least squares. So if you don't remember that, go back to that first video. And you remember how to minimize a function using calculus. So this I did not actually cover but um, it has to do with taking derivatives of functions. So if you never learn that, then I guess there's nothing you're going to review that's going to help, so just stick with it and see what you get out of it. But for those of you who have had calculus, and maybe it was a while ago, um, just recall that to find uh, minima in this case, you take the first derivative and find its zeros, and then you verify that the second derivative is positive, because that indicates that it is concave up and you have found the minimum. Okay, so this is the one sample t-test. It is the simplest model you could possibly have in uh, for a GLM. It's just y equals beta naught plus epsilon. So if I write this out further, and where y1 through yn are, for example, they could be bold activation estimates in a single voxel for each of n subjects, and we just want the mean bold activation. This is the model you would use. So the design matrix is a single column of ones, and then we have a single parameter, beta naught, and then the error term. So a student asked me a couple of years ago, they were like, well, why is beta naught the mean? And I was like, oh, well, if we multiply this out, which is what I typically do, you'll see in future examples, to help understand what a linear model is modeling, I just do the matrix multiplication, and you get this. So what this tells me, and then I look at each subject. So Y1's estimate is beta naught. Well, so is Y2's estimate, also beta naught. Yn's estimate is also beta naught. So beta naught is this number that best summarizes the brain activation for all of my subjects. So intuitively, you might think that's the mean, but it could be something else. Um, maybe you think something else is a better estimate. Maybe you think a median is better or something like that. So why is beta naught in this case a mean? Well, because we're using least squares. So it all has to do with the cost function that we're using. And I want to write this out and... Um, then I'll do a quick example using a different cost function, not least squares, to illustrate when um, beta naught, how to make beta naught equal something else. All right, so uh, we are working with, oops, let me make that black. Okay, yi, if I write the equation out for a single subject, is beta naught plus epsilon which tells me that yi hat is simply beta naught hat. So if I want to figure out my estimate for a single subject, it is beta naught hat. And recall the least squares. It looks like this. The sum from i equals 1 to n of yi minus y i hat. And if you remember, if you close your eyes, you remember back I had drawn a, a linear regression with a line going through the data points and I drew on the graph what the residual was. And I said, okay, well, it's intuitive. We wanna get this line as close to our data points as we can. Um, so we could do this numerous ways, absolute difference, squared difference, et cetera. And we settled on the squared difference. And I told you it was because it had, part of the reason is because it has nice um, properties statistically in terms of getting the distribution. There are other reasons why to use it. Um, one being it has a unique solution. The other example I'm gonna show you does not necessarily give you a unique solution. Anyway, so least squares is what we use. I'm just gonna call this F of 
beta not hat. Uh, in this case, it's just beta not hat because I only have one parameter. And this is i equals one to n of y i minus beta not hat squared. Okay, so let's take the derivative of this. And we're gonna get, uh, if you remember how to take the derivative of these things, this square right here is gonna come down. Uh, whoops, sorry, I started deleting and I went too far. So the square is gonna come down, that's where the two comes from is the exponent. And then I'm gonna have yi minus beta naught hat. I rewrite what was in the parentheses without harming it and then are changing it, and then I post multiply it by the derivative of what's inside the parentheses, which in this case is negative one. So to review, this two comes down here, and then the next step, and then you just write this out exactly as it was, and then you multiply by the derivative of the thing I just highlighted, in, which is just negative one. the highlighting. Okay, and then let's make this prettier. This is just simply negative 2 times the sum i equals 1 to n of yi, and I'm actually going to distribute uh, the summation or just, and so I have the sum i equals 1 to n of yi. If I sum beta not hat n times, I'm going to get n beta not hats. So it looks like this. All right. The second derivative is simply going to be negative two. Um, this sum with yi goes away, it's just a constant, times um, the derivative of what's in there, which is just negative n, which is equal to two n. So the second derivative is positive, yay. That means the zero of the first derivative will be a minima. So let's do that. F prime of beta naught hat equal to zero implies negative two times the sum from i equal, oops, I need a parentheses there, i equals one to n of y i minus n beta naught is equal to zero. But you guys can do this in your head faster than I can write it. This implies the sum from i equals one to n of y i minus n beta naught hat, oops, I forgot a hat up here, is equal to zero. I divided by negative two on both sides, so that's gone, which implies the sum from i equals one to n of y i equals I add n beta to both sides, n beta not hat. And last but not least, last but not least squares, haha, we get the sum i equals one to n y i over n equals beta not hat. So unfortunately, I can't think of a way to get here without doing math, but there's the answer. So the first part of the answer is beta not is, beta not hat is the value that best summarizes all of the data points. And since we're using least squares to find our estimate, beta not hat is equal to the mean. Yep, makes sense. Okay, what if we use a different loss function? FCN is function. Uh, specifically, the other one I mentioned in the lecture, what if instead we use f of beta naught hat is equal to the sum i equals one to n of y i, oops, oops, oops. I should have just erased, okay. The absolute value of y i minus beta naught hat. Leave it right there. All right, so this is a little bit harder. Um, if you remember in calculus, the, taking a derivative of an absolute value is a bit tricky. Um, another name for this is L1 minimization. Okay, 
look that up. It comes up everywhere. Um, everywhere. Computer scientists love it. Um, actually, the lasso, if you've heard of uh, lasso regression, that has an L1 minimization in it. Anyway, turns out that beta naught hat in this case is the median. How about that? And I, the best way to kind of understand this quickly is just to do a quick uh, geometric illustration. So I'm just going to plot some data points here. And if you, these are my yi's plotted on a line, okay? And if you think about a candidate for your beta naught hat, if you're using this absolute value, if you're trying to minimize this absolute distance, well, okay, if, if I stick it way out here, sure, it's really close to this point and this one, but it's super far from this one. So if I draw little lines that are the distance from my x to each of these points and sum those up, that's my loss function. So the fact that my x is so far from the data points over here on the left-hand side, you can tell that that's a poor choice. So x will not be beta naught hat in this case. But if I move it closer to the middle, you can tell that that will be a better estimate. And sure enough, if I move it onto the median, since the median is the 50th percentile, uh, that ends up being the solution. Um, so it's only the case, I should add, that this will be the median if you're running this model I just showed you with only a column of ones. It turns out that just for a general regression equation, if you put age and other regressors into the model and you use this loss function, this absolute loss, uh, absolute difference loss function, um, it can be problematic. Sometimes it's used if you have outliers in your data, but it has some poor behaviors. For example, it might not have a unique solution, um, which isn't preferred. Okay, anyway, so these handwritten notes, I will post those. There's a link in the info box that will take you to those. Okay, so I wrote that out. All right, so do you have that? Um, so now you should be able to answer this question. Why is the estimate of beta naught in a one sample t-test the sample mean? Um, so it's two pieces of information. Remember, beta naught is the best summary of all of our data and we're using least squares, that's why. Also, when would the estimate of beta naught be the median of the data? So you should know what that is too. That's all I got. Thanks a bunch. Uh, see the info box for both the link to the notes that I just wrote out as well as various ways to connect with Mumford Brain Stats. There's a Facebook group, uh, I'm on Twitter, and there's the Tumblr. So that's it. Talk to you later.